Okay, we shall start now. Um, the the COVID-19 pandemic has had a great impact in the fisheries industry in addition to the threats being faced from resource depletion and limited market access due to IUU fishing, pollution, and habitat destructions. With the changing ecosystem, fisheries management and marine uh, conservation is important to promote sustainability in the fisheries industry. This is because um, sustainable, uh, sustainability, sustainability in fisheries will generate environmental, social, and economic benefits in the long-term run. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Api Melekivakana Singa, or you can call me Api, and I am the Trade Promotion Officer for InfoFish, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Welcome to our third Tuna webinar series on certification and technology. This third Tuna webinar series will focus on uh, certification and technology in the tuna industry with the topics highlighting updates and importance of sustainable seafood certification and the latest technology on satellite communications and blockchain technology. We are grateful to have three speakers that will be providing this information to us. Please allow me to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Our first speaker today will be Dr. Paolo Bray. Dr. Paolo Bray has been engaged for the last 30 years in protecting endangered species in environment and in environmental conservation activities. He is currently the director of international programs, Dolph Dolphin Safe Project, the Health the Earth Island Institute, and founder and director of World Sustainability Organization which is our sponsor for today's, which is one of our sponsors for today's webinar. And he also is also the director of the Friend of the Sea Certification Program. Over his almost 30 years of experience in conservation, Dr. Bray has helped start and develop several certification projects. He has lived and traveled all over the world and his international and pragmatic approach to sustainability and his dedication to conservation projects has helped to establish organizations aimed to achieve important and tangible environmental protection results. He's often invited as speakers at the major FAO in, uh, meetings, as well as our InfoFish conferences, as well as other um, major events. Uh, we also have uh, Ms. Kathleen O'Neill. Ms. O'Neill is our spe second speaker for today. She is the head of the science and uh, sustainability development of Settling. Uh, for those that, of you that do not know uh, Settling, Settling is a Spanish uh, engineering company that is specialized in satellite communications and the fishing industry. Prior to joining Settling, uh, Ms. O'Neill has worked in and studied issues relating to marine conservation and sustainability in Australia, Iceland, Norway, and Greenland. Um, as head of the Science and St Sustainability Department, Catherine works on projects that promote sustainable, sustainable actions within the fishing industries and coordinates with NGOs and scientific organizations to make the best use of set, set links, services, and uh, data. She is a sailor herself, and she has carried out research at sea and established direct relationship, relationships with those that depend on the ocean to better understand their needs and limitations. Uh, we are also uh, honored to have Mr. Maxine Paul, our third speaker today. Mr. Uh, Paul has been working in the tuna industry for more than 12 years at one of the leading tuna trading house. After seeing the potential of uh, blockchain technology for traceability, he joined Akato, uh, a Bangkok-based blockchain software development house as Chief Marketing Officer. Last year, they launched their blockchain uh, tuna traceability application, which is used by brand in Europe and Asia to track and trace tuna cans. This is the first application in the world using a public blockchain network. A, a very warm welcome to you all speakers and thank you for being here with us. Just before we begin uh, with this webinar, there are some housekeeping matters that needs to be uh, address to all the participants present in this webinar. Um, we have a 
um, simultaneous uh, interpretation um, uh, during this webinar. So if you look at the bottom of the screen, you will find an interpretation tab and you will see English and Spanish options. For Spanish listeners, we have interpretation from English to Spanish. Uh, Spanish. Therefore, you can click on the, the Spanish options at the bottom of the interpretation tab. For those that would like to post a question to the speakers, please do so in the Q&A tab on the bottom of the screen. We will have these questions directed to the speakers after all the presentations have been done. Um, so questions will be read by myself. So we kindly address your questions to the specific speakers accordingly. Uh, we will also be requesting the speakers to also answer some of the questions uh, by typing out the answers on the Q&A tab at their convenient time. Um, thirdly, we also be providing uh, a set of all questions for you to fill. We would appreciate if you could take time to answer these, these poll questions now or towards the end of the webinar. Uh, we also encourage also encourage participants to uh, to provide feedback feedback on today's webinar on the Zoom chat box. Uh, this would be really helpful for us. So now we would uh, we will start off with the presentations. Uh, now I would like to invite Dr. Paula Bray uh, for the first presentation. Mr. Bray, please. Sorry, Mr. Bray, can you unmute yourself, um, please? Thanks. Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Can you see the presentation? Yes, the presentation. OK, Same so here. thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and InfoFish for uh, inviting me for this great opportunity to provide my input on this uh, subject. Uh, it's great to be back with the InfoFish uh, family uh, in a virtual way, and I hope uh, to be able to see you all soon uh, also at the forthcoming uh, InfoFish conference in Bangkok uh, in person uh, next year. So um, <clears throat> let, me, let me provide you uh, with a short introduction to the work of WSO, which I represent, the World Sustainability Organization. Started uh, from over 30 years experience on the Dolphin Safe Tuna project of the Earth Island Institute, precursor of all uh, sustainable fisheries certification standards, WSO launched uh, Friend of the Sea in 2008. Friend of the Sea is currently the only sustainable seafood standard uh, recognized by the national accreditation bodies and which with the same seal of approval can potentially certify both uh, sustainable fisheries and aquaculture. In 2018, the WSO has launched a parallel project, Friend of the Earth, for the certification of products uh, from sustainable agriculture and farming. Over, the, over 1,000 companies in more than uh, 100 countries have uh, products certified by these standards. The sustainable seafood movement uh, has grown up uh, side by side with the increasing fisheries captures and aqu aquaculture growth. From the beginning of the industrial fishing activity, in the early 50s to the reaching of the maximum total catches in the year 2000 and the rapid growth of aquaculture which in 2012 produced more than fisheries. The first environmental laws for marine protection to be introduced were those aimed at protecting iconic animals like whales by the IWC at the end of the 80s. Then in 1994, the UN and the FAO produced uh, the Law of the Sea and the FAO Code of Conduct. In 2005, the FAO provided some guidelines for eco-labeling of uh, fish and fishery products from marine capture fisheries. And the EU also started to regulate organic certifications as well as IUU and shark finning among the others. The first campaigns uh, carried out by NGOs and pressure groups were focused on iconic and charismatic species like the Greenpeace, Save the Whales, 
seals, and the dolphin safe tuna project of the Earth Island Institute. This one in particular can be considered as the precursor of all certifications of sustainable seafood, as for the first time an eco label was used to lead the industry to change its fishing practices. The whole uh, worldwide tuna industry joined the project with the exception of the Mexican fleet and dolphins mortality dropped 98% in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. In 1996, the Unilever, one of the major seafood companies at the time, set up its own certification program, the Marine Stewardship Council, with the help of the WWF, which then became a major certification promoted by the seafood industry itself. Also BAP and Global Gap are certifications uh, which have been created by the production and the retail industry and gradually gained momentum. In 2008, Friend of the Sea was launched, the only independent certification for seafood from sustainable fisheries and aquaculture. COVID happened in a moment where uh, some changes were already occurring. The general public, consumers and new generations have now access to an incredible amount of information and are becoming increasingly aware of human impact on the environment. All this through the web and other new technologies. As a consequence, they are increasingly demanding towards companies' practices and respect for the environment and workers. COVID's lockdown experience and concerns about uh, new waves of pandemics from cruel trade of exotic animals has further boosted these changes in demand. Seafood companies in the future will have to provide uh, third party evidence of compliance with marine protection requirements, fish welfare, social accountability. They will have to increasingly compete also with alternative plant and cell based seafood products. According to an in depth analysis commissioned by the United Nations Convention on Trade and Development, uh, approximately 14% of the total seafood production is certified for its environmental and social sustainability practices. Friend of the Sea leads in terms of uh, metric tons certified, considering the fact that, it's cert that it certifies both aquaculture and fisheries, followed by MSC and the major aquaculture specific certifications. The same study estimated the Friend of the Sea to be the major certification for tuna products in terms of number of approved fisheries and total metric tons, including frozen tuna. As far as uh, certified aquaculture production is concerned, the study concluded that only 6.3% is certified for sustainability. It is likely that this number has increased in the last uh, few years. Global gap is the most widespread standard, but it is B2B, business to business mainly, uh, so not really facing consumers with its label. Uh, while Friend of the Sea is second, uh, followed closely by BAP and ASC. Before analyzing the impact of COVID on uh, consumer trends, let's see the actual impact of COVID has had on production and demand themselves. The FAO estimates a forecasted 1.7% reduction in seafood production, equivalent to uh, mi minus 1.9 million metric tons. This is, however, quite in line with previous year's reduction. The most likely reason uh, of this uh, stable production being the fact that uh, fishing is tied to fishing seasons. Seafood companies can hold in cold stores, fish caught for several months, and aquaculture companies cannot easily slow down nor stop rearing and production. So there, is, there isn't much flexibility in changes in production. Since, however, demand most likely reduced during COVID period uh, more than production, global prices index has reduced 8.3%. As far as seafood demand is concerned, a global data is not yet available. However, we know that airlines, restaurants and tourism have dropped more than 50% and in some cases and in some countries up to 70% with the COVID situation. This has dramatically decreased the demand of shrimps, mussels, cephalopods, 
Salmon demand uh, is forecasted to decrease by 15%. Whitefish demand forecast uh, varies uh, depending on type of product. And in general, the trend is likely to be going toward lower value species. Because of the occurring second waves of COVID, the recovery will be slow due, the, due to the economic constraints. COVID's impact on tuna is so far mostly positive for canned tuna and negative for non-canned tuna. A boost in canned tuna purchases because of lockdown scares combined with uh, stable supplies led also to an increase in price, different from the downward trend for most other seafood. Non-canned tuna demand instead dropped because of drop in tourism, as we said, traveling, restaurants, combined with uh, fresh tuna vendors having to comply with social distancing rules. COVID also has had an impact on fisheries management with waiving of observers' requirements or audits and cancellations and delays of RFMO's meetings. It is important uh, to uh, implement alternatives. In some cases, this is already occurring as we are seeing right now today. Uh, such as CCTVs and online conferencing and auditing. COVID has also had an impact on uh, consumers' demand for sustainable seafood. 58% of interviewed seafood business professionals expect in general much more focus on sustainability after COVID. In fact, the consumers, and this study refers to Europe in recent years, and younger generations in particular have expressed an increasing willingness to pay for sustainable products, up to almost 14% more than the average products. Consumers are becoming more and more aware and knowledgeable through the internet about environmental and social issues. In particular, from this European study, they show concern about welfare, endangered species and pollution in aquaculture and endangered species and overfishing as far as seafood from fisheries is concerned. Concern about social accountability, good working conditions, is still relatively lower, but will likely grow in importance in the next few years. Fish welfare together with the social accountability is a subject of increasing concern for consumers. As information spreads on books and media, on how also fish feel pain and are sentient, an increasing number of consumers, 79%, request aquaculture and fishing companies that fish welfare be better protected. This new drive is leading major sustainable seafood standards like Friend of the Sea to expand its requirements on fish welfare for aquaculture and soon for fishing. Social accountability is a growing concern as investigation uh, at uncovered conditions of modern day slavery feeding the supply chain of most countries. The FAO has produced guidance documents in regard and Friend of the Sea has been the only certification standard including from the start, from its very beginning, mandatory requirements for social accountability, which have been further expanded in the latest version of the standard. Also at the country level, important changes are happening, such as in Thailand, where the government has invested $87 million to combat IUU fishing. As consumers are becoming more and more concerned about the impact of seafood production on the environment and workers, they are starting to shift away to plant-based seafood. This change has increased with COVID with 23% U.S. consumers saying that they have been eating more plant-based meals due to COVID. The growing trend for plant-based seafood has been confirmed by the Good Food Institute. The plant-based seafood market is still very small, only approximately $9.5 million, but overcoming technical and funding difficulties rapidly. Friend of the Sea strongly supports also the plant-based and cell-based approach as in several cases, it can be a very uh, lower impact uh, alternative. 
certifiable and it is certifiable according to its friend of the earth agriculture standards requirements. The number of meat and seafood alternative protein companies is growing fast. On the last column, you can see a list of plant and cell based companies. It's very interesting to notice uh, the fact that uh, also several uh, seafood companies, including tuna companies, are now developing their own uh, plant based uh, seafood uh, as an alternative approach. Singapore. Uh, sorry on the last column you can see a list of plant and cell based companies and singapore which has been working to move away from uh, its uh, dependence on imported food has become a leader in alternative seafood here uh, is an example of a plant-based tuna made of uh, pea beans rice some flour beet juice and apple extract for the color cell-based meat another alternative sometimes called lab-grown meat or clean meat, has identical cellular structure to animal meat, but doesn't require slaughter. Instead, cells from initial donor animals are grown in a bioreactor. The cell lines can continue to be used over and over, creating great potential to reduce animal suffering. The process is, uh, however, energy intensive and this has potential to improve. Last but not least, uh, in my presentation, uh, the COVID experience with the impossibility for auditors or difficulties for auditors to travel has also led to the development of alternative audit solutions, which might in the future, we hope, become the standard way to run audits. Friend of the Sea has developed uh, SARA, the Sustainable Augmented Reality Audit Solution which allows to carry out the audits remotely, collecting more and undisputable evidence by, than, the, than the default audit uh, style uh, by means of uh, videos recorded during the on-site remote audit and saved on uh, blockchain. This greatly enhances the final audit report, saves money, reduces pollution from traveling, and keeps auditors safe. The FAO has highlighted this new solution from a friend of the sea and companies have greatly appreciated it. In conclusion, the COVID impact on seafood and tuna will be both negative and positive. Supply seems to be able to continue at the current levels, but demand is uh, as reduced has decreased and it's likely to reduce for certain products. Fisheries management and certification audits should not be relaxed. And uh, online and uh, remote alternatives are being implemented and should be uh, promoted and uh, further implemented uh, to continue with the current uh, level of uh, fisheries management. Consumers will be more demanding on issues like fish welfare and accountability and social accountability. And uh, the market for plant and cell-based uh, alternatives uh, and seafood will uh, grow and uh, can reduce pressure on wild stocks, but obviously it will also somehow represent, uh, let's say, a competing alternative uh, for the seafood uh, uh, industry, even though, as I mentioned, uh, the, the seafood industry itself is now investing on this. And this is also a very positive approach and, uh, and it shows how the seafood industry, which in, in the past has also been a precursor in uh, deploying and developing sustainable uh, initiatives, is also leading the way in this, uh, on this subject. If the industry and all stakeholders will be prepared to all this, we can make it through the pandemic and even improve. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Paolo Bray, for that comprehensive presentation. Uh, I'm sure most of the participants here um, would love to uh, know more and probably uh, ask uh, questions. Just a reminder to all the participants, if you have any questions for the presentations, please uh, have them posted on the Q&A tab. Um, so uh, 
We'll move on now to the second speaker for today. We have Ms. Catherine O'Neill from Settling. Over to you, Ms. Catherine. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I think your volume is a bit low. Maybe you could put it up a little bit. Um, how about now? Can you hear oh, me okay? Great. Now, now it's perfect. <laughs> Okay, so hopefully all of you can see my screen right now. Yes, we can. Okay, so, um, well, good morning for everybody from Europe and good afternoon to <laughs> everyone else, wherever you are. Um, so first of all, thanks for, for having me for the conference. Um, and Paolo, thank you for, for your very interesting presentation. So yeah, my name is Catherine Gabriela O'Neill and uh, I work in the Science and Sustainability Department of Satling. So this is where we focus on guiding development within the company um, to, make, to make sure that we're always moving towards sustainability and we try to keep up with uh, the latest research in the industry. So I'll go into more of that in, in a minute. So first of all, um, Satlink, as I said, we're, we're a Spanish-based company. We're tech, a technological company specialized in satellite communications. And we work very closely with the fishing industry and with management. So even though we're based in Spain, due to the very wide reach of the fishing industry, we actually have offices all around the world, um, such as South America, areas of Asia, Africa, and so on. But um, so by having a global person, presence, we actually have direct contact with, um, you know, the regional fisheries management organizations, governments, fishermen, and so on worldwide. So that means that we can really adapt to what everybody needs in, in each area. In terms of sustainability, our aim is to design and produce the tools that will help inform, monitor, and aid the work of all of those that uh, use the ocean's resources. So we think that to ensure sustainability is important to consider everybody's needs. Um, so from the industry itself to regulators, RFMOs and public administration. Most of our hardware is designed in-house. So this means that we have full control and freedom over our products. And also by keeping up to date on the state of, for instance, fisheries research or management decisions and basically what is happening in every ocean we can focus development on anticipating the needs of what could be required in the future and then provide features and technology that will help um, those that we work with to respond to and reduce emerging threats to the world's oceans. So it gives us a chance to, to actually anticipate what is going to happen. So during the presentation, I'll be outlining the, the work we do, who we work for and the different um, solutions that we provide for, for the fishing industry and for management and just give examples of how our technology is being used for research and sustainability. So as I mentioned, we, we really work with um, just about all levels because we think that sustainability lies in working together with everybody. Um, so we work from, with people from governments and regulators to those actually at sea and those studying the oceans and understanding how to use its resources. So we try to pr provide tools that are gonna fit everybody's needs. So in the first place, um, for governments and regulators, our emphasis is mainly on monitoring and tracking vessels and fleets. So that's a way to reduce um, IUU, so illegal, unreported, and un unregulated fishing, um, and increase the traceability and transparency within the fishing industry. So in that, in that area, we have um, several solutions. So that would include VMS, um, vessel monitoring systems, electronic reporting systems or ERS and electronic monitoring. Then for the fishing industry, our focus is on reducing the impacts of different fishing practices, whether it's by providing the tools that we need to keep track of, that fishermen need to keep track of their gear and then um, you know, a way to reduce ghost fishing. Um, like we do, for instance, with our, with our long line buoy, the ILL buoy, or we can increase the selectivity of specific fishing methods with, for instance, the ISD buoy. And then lastly, we also provide an oceanographic surface that will help fishermen spend less time at sea overall and then guide their routes and reduce fuel emissions. Then lastly, we work directly with um, NGOs and research institutes to either directly contribute to sustainability in a, in a very tangible way, um, or to explore the future possibilities of our technology. 
Okay, so for governments and regulators, we'll go into a bit more detail of how each of these solutions work and how they can help to ensure sustainability. So most of uh, our solutions in this aspect are geared towards uh, monitoring and collecting data to ensure traceability. So the first of these is the Vessel Monitoring System, um, or VMS. So this technology is very straightforward. Basically, the main component of VMS is um, a series of GPS trackers on board fishing vessels that are constantly transmitting the ID, location, heading, and speed of every vessel while they're at sea. So this information is transmitted in real time using Inmarsat's global satellite network. Um, and that information is transferred to fishing authorities or to vessel owners who can store the information and use it in studies on fishing efforts, uh, activities of vessels at sea. Um, so for instance, this is like something that the Global Fishing Watch does. And they actually even use uh, arti artificial intelligence to identify when a, ves a vessel is fishing. Also by providing the information in real time, authorities can easily monitor and control the access to specific ex exclusive economic zones or to marine protected areas. And they can intervene if they notice any kind of suspicious activity. So our solution was initially developed for the Spanish fishing, fishing authorities, but since then it's been the choice system for several national fishing authorities. And right now it's deployed internationally on over 4,000 vessels worldwide. Um, we've also adapted our systems into what we call the, the VMS nano system. So that's an even more affordable option, a smaller option. Um, it's especially designed for artisanal fleets. So in terms of data collection, uh, a problem that administrations often have is that data is collected in different formats and it's very difficult to compare things that come from different sources. Um, so for this reason, we developed an electronic reporting system or ERS, which is basically a program that serves as an electronic logbook, and it allows fishermen to easily log their catches while on board. So this information is then sent to relevant authorities who can store it and analyze it to inform management decisions. By using the same platform across an entire fleet, the data is cohesive, it's easy to work with, and it makes it a lot easier to make any kind of studies or decisions based on it. So our current system was developed with uh, OPAGAC, with vessel owners and with the Spanish Public Administration to make sure that we would be collecting relevant data. And it can also be easily tailored to, to any changes in data requirements that might happen over time. So right now, the system is on board um, and on land. And among other things, it provides an easy way to keep track of fad buoys, fad fishing activities, and provide generally comparable catch reports. So that makes it, um, that means that data is collected in a cohesive, controlled system, and that simplifies any kind of research or analyses that need to be done. Okay. And lastly, um, electronic monitoring, so uh, also it's known as EM or REM. So thanks to, to the current pandemic, to COVID-19, uh, EM has actually gotten quite a lot of attention recently. Um, it's a technology we've already been working with for over seven years. Um, so this is a really good example of, of how we try to anticipate where the industry go is going and the tools that might become necessary. So in electronic monitoring, the overarching goal is to achieve full transparency and, trans and traceability within the fishing industry. Um, so our concept of, of EM is basically just a catch-all solution that is going to integrate already existing programs and it brings them into the digital age, so where data can be easily collected and cross-referenced. Um, our solution for EM is uh, what we call the C-Tube, so like YouTube. And to develop it, we worked together with uh, Digital Observer Services, DOS, who are based in Bilbao, um, to get the, the perspective of experienced fisheries observers and biologists. So with their involvement, we basically we place cameras in all the areas of fishing vessels where the fish is handled and processed. And these cameras are just constantly recording. So they record every fishing activity that happens on board. The footage from these cameras, together with GPS position, vessel ID, or any other um, circumstantial information are stored on encrypted and secure hard drives on board. 
Once full, these hard drives are removed and taken to the relevant authorities or review centers where, where they can have access to the data. And then also to avoid any kind of tampering with the system while they're at sea, the health of it is constantly monitored. Um, so we can also send alarms if we notice anything going wrong and vessel position and even still images of onboard activities can be sent by a satellite to offices on land. So that makes it very easy to control activities even as they're happening. Um, so like with VMS, we've adapted our, our EM systems to different types of vessels. We have a few different solutions. So right now we're currently installed on board more than 225 vessels in the world. And we also see this as a potential alternative career for fisheries observers. Now with the COVID-19 pandemic, many have, have basically been out of a job. Um, so it's also a way to boost local employment in areas where we've helped establish regional data review centers. So there they can employ local observers and technicians. So and now with COVID-19, as I said, the, the world is really waking up to the benefits of, of EM. And I hope that um, RFMOs take this as an opportunity to, to help establish these systems elsewhere. Um, EM can basically ensure that, that important fisheries data is collected even when it's impossible for a human observer to be on board. So in general, it's a system we're very excited about as we think that there are benefits for using it um, for just about everybody. And from, for instance, from consumers who can be sure that their fish are coming from fully monitored and documented fisheries to observers who will see their working conditions improved to governments and RFMOs who will receive constant, uniform and unbiased data to inform their management decisions on things like uh, fishing quotas, limiting fishing activities and just generally protecting the sustainability of the oceans. So we really we're excited about the solution and, and where it's going to go in the future. Um, okay, so although collecting data and monitoring is, of course, a very crucial part of sustainability, part of our work is also to work um, directly with the industry. So we're trying to find ways to reduce the impact of already existing fishing practices. So, um, for instance, one important impact of the fishing industry is the incidence of ghost gear. So that's just lost gear that basically keeps on fishing without any kind of control. So our longline buoy, which we call the ILL buoy, aims to avoid longliner gear from getting lost in the first place by providing a means for fishermen to keep track of their gear even if their lines break. So the ILL buoy, it's light, it's easy to use and easy to attach on longline gear. It's powered with solar panels um, and has essentially unlimited lifetime. And the main feature of it is it is equipped with a GPS tracker that transmits its position to the vessel at the click of a button. So um, buoys used by, by longline fishing have typically worked with radio communications, which are only efficient if the vessel is close to a buoy. Um, so this means that in the past, if, if the line would break and the gear was lost, it would be quite difficult to locate it and to get it back. However, by using satellite communications, no matter how far the gear is, it can be located and retrieved. Furthermore, even though satellite information is obviously private, the positions could potentially be shared with um, multiple users regardless of their location. So that also opens the door to better monitoring of the fishing effort in, in the long line fleet. So, Another important uh, part of our, of our work is to provide satellite and eco sounder buoys for fish aggregating devices or, or FADs for the tuna per sign fleet. Um, so just like with the ILL buoys, these buoys have GPS location. So that means fishermen can um, keep track of their gear and retrieve FADs that they're no longer using. However, these buoys are also equipped with eco sounders. So they allow fishermen to identify fads with fish under them and plan out their, their route, making their time at sea more efficient. Um, until now, eco sounder buoys only provided an estimate of tonnage. So they didn't differentiate between tuna species like skipjack, yellowfin, or big eye. Um, as the target species for purse sign is generally skip that, skipjack, and there are some concerns with overfishing for some of the other species, in certain oceans. Um, we thought it would be important to design a buoy that could also inform fishermen of the presence or absence 
of specific uh, species under a buoy. So by applying the most recent fisheries acoustics research, we've actually achieved this goal. We're now identifying the proportion of different tuna species under fads in the Indian Ocean um, using the ISD or selective buoy that you can see here um, with an accuracy of about 80%. So obviously there's room for improvement, but we're, we're very happy. Um, I think the, the implications for this are important, not just for fishermen, but also for management. A few RFMOs are already exploring the possibility of using buoy ecosounder information as a means to provide fisheries independent uh, abundance indices of tuna that could help inform stock assessments. So until now, this, uh, this of course would have been limited to just tuna as a general term, because it hasn't been possible to differentiate between the species. But the ISD buoy could really help take this idea of uh, buoy derived indices a step further by actually separating abundance estimates from the ecosounder into individual species. Then from an industry side, of course, having this information of which species are present under a buoy, it will allow fishermen to not only plan their trips more efficiently, but also just target fads with the, the species that they're interested in. So this could help increase the selectivity of, uh, of first sign gear. And then uh, lastly, um, we provide also our, our oceanographic service, where we basically provide the fishing industry with updated oceanographic information and forecasts that will help guide their trips to productive fishing grounds and reduce search times. So that could result in fewer fuel emissions and more efficient time spent at sea. Um, also, of course, another way this could be used is, um, for instance, with the current maps, like you see in the, in the image here, um, where they can spot areas where the current favors their route and so then shorten the trip to harbor, for instance. And then relating this to, to the previous slides, um, we also think that by linking the information on species distributions that will be provided by the ISD buoys and linking that to oceanographic information, we might be able to gain a better understanding of the environmental preferences of different species of tuna. So um, this could also it provides some really, really useful information for, for both the industry and for management. And then if we look at sustainability as, well, we look at sustainability as our goal for today, but we also, of course, look at it as our, as our goal for the future. So today we try to take direct actions to, to help the ocean, and we do that through our zero impact campaign. Um, so our Zero Impact Campaign is it's basically an, initi an initiative that we have taken to, um, to reduce our footprint on the world. So part of this is to reduce the plastic that we use, for instance, in our buoys. So replacing some of the plastics that we can't avoid with recycled materials. Um, but the most relevant thing that we, we have done has been to pair with, well, to work with uh, Burio, the Global Ghost Gear Initiative, so of World Animal Protection, to facilitate the collection and recycling of over 100 tons of fishing gear, as well as establish recycling centers in four fishing communities of Chile. So this was a two year project that uh, just came to a close this past year, but it was awarded the second prize in the oceans category of the Premios Latinoamérica Verde. So this is definitely an achievement that we're proud of. And now we're working on continuing this work and we're in the final stages of setting up a similar initiative somewhere else. Um, however, as I said, we're also looking into the future of what could happen with our different technologies. So, um, as I mentioned, we think that EM is, is the way to go. Um, when talking about EM, I mentioned that uh, in, in a few places there had been, we had established data review centers. So, this work was a joint effort between the Nature Conservancy and local fishing authorities that enabled the, our sea tube system to be installed on 31 vessels from several Pacific Island nations. So by transferring the data review process to the fisheries authorities directly, this project contributed to building infrastructure and generating employment for fisheries observers and technicians within the local communities. So far, the project has collected over 10,000 sets and 500 trips, and it will likely help shape the future and scaling up of electronic monitoring to gain information on those fleets where monitoring is generally sparse. Um, 
And then when, when I talked about fishing gear loss, I also mentioned that our, our eco sounder buoys have also a GPS position, which allows fishermen to keep track of their gear. So um, in some cases, fads unfortunately end up out of reach of vessels using them, so they can actually end up on shore. And to minimize the impact of this gear on coastal environments, for instance, OPAGAC, uh, the Seychelles Fishing Authorities, the Island Development Company, and the Island Conservation Society, we all pioneered a, a FAD watch program that aimed to intercept FADs before they ended up on shore. So our role in this initiative was to provide the software that would alert partners about FADs that came close to the islands so they could retrieve them before they caused any damage. And then our, our latest contributions to research have been uh, twofold. So we, we facilitate the collaboration between industry partners and the SPC in their latest Pacific tuna tagging program. Um, so we helped share information with the SPC that would allow them to identify tuna hotspots and increase the amount of tuna that they can tag. And apparently it's going very well. And then the second way we've contributed is by um, customizing our ISD buoy so that they can carry out small scale experiments during the trip. So in summary, we're, we're really convinced that uh, technology's potential is endless. Even today, we're seeing advances that we never would have thought possible. In the future, we envision technology as a tool that's going to help connect all sides of the fishing industry to help give a big picture perspective of what is happening in the oceans and to help us reduce our impacts and, and manage the ocean's resources. So what is next is really, is really up to all of us, and it's it's hard to say, but it's definitely a very exciting trip we've got ahead of us. And that's all from me. So with that, I will leave you to the next speaker. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, um, Ms. Catherine, for that comprehensive, uh, interesting presentation, rather. Um, the, you've uh, mentioned some of the important technologies that have uh, been with Satellite and that has been implemented in some of the countries. Um, so I will now move on to our last speaker for today, Mr. Maxim Paul from Apato. Yes, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, to InfoFish for uh, actually having me and thank you very much for uh, my fellow presenters. Your presentation were actually very interesting and uh, um, I will start to share my screen. Is it okay for everyone? Yes. All right. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so yes. Um, as um, I said, good morning, everybody. Yeah. Um, sorry, Mr. Paul. Could you put it on uh, presenter view? Uh, sure. Yes. Okay. Right. So, um, yeah. So my name is Maxim Paul. Uh, actually, um, I have been in the tuna industry for quite a long time now. Uh, I started in tuna industry more than 13 years ago in Bangkok, and uh, what I was doing basically was selling uh, canned tuna, a trading house to uh, most of the major retailers and uh, brand owners around the world. So in uh, Europe, in US, in Australia, South America, a bit everywhere. And uh, I've been assisting at the, at the InfoFish conference uh, yeah, since 2008, I think. And Every time and every year, I think I had a meeting about sustainability and traceability. Every single of my clients uh, were asking about traceability application, uh, what is done for sust sustainability, and uh, what can they offer to the consumer. And sorry to say, but there was not actually very good solutions uh, at the time. Uh, of course, we had a friend of the sea, uh, which uh, was the Dolphin Self logo, which uh, was bringing actually additional certification, MSC starting to uh, pop up and actually uh, gaining momentum. And, uh, but it was not enough uh, for some of the customers. Uh, some of those applications was a bit more expensive. Uh, you know, you had to pay a premium on MSC. So for some markets, it was not really suitable. Uh, when you are dealing with canned tuna, um, the margins are quite small and um, it was quite difficult for the retailers to implement it. So, that's the idea how it came from and why I'm here today is because when blockchain came along, uh, let's say in 2015, uh, we saw that there would be a potential for traceability and sustainability. So that's why I'm here today and that's why actually I joined the company called Atato that we founded in 2017. 
and uh, we are based in Bangkok. Uh, we are a software company, uh, uh, and basically we are developing blockchain solutions for enterprises. And the reason I'm here today is because uh, our first project was a trustability application. And we said, okay, so there is a problem here. Uh, let's say the tuna market is kind of a traditional uh, old fashioned way. And uh, let's try to bring actually some technology into it. And uh, blockchain is a very good use case to bring transparency and trustability along the supply chain. So this is what I'm going to present today. I'm not going to go into very detail uh, specific about blockchain, how it works very briefly in order to not uh, uh, make every, everybody bored. But then after all, I will uh, present the application that we did and how our customers today are using it. So that's the questions we often have. Uh, what is blockchain? It has been a buzzword for quite some years. And uh, I think it was uh, to his favor, but uh, also to his detriment because people were expecting uh, the moon and uh, blockchain basically to make it very simple. It's a shared computer. It's a shared computer and a shared database when you can exchange information uh, with actually parties that you generally don't trust. So if you, see, or if you are a factory, you can share information with your customers or other factories without uh, actually bringing any kind of uh, privacy detail into the, into the mix. So you could say uh, this is kind of technical, but basically it's kind of a revolution in computer science. So it was not really possible before, and uh, blockchain brought this uh, innovation that we are actually using today in many different fields. So blockchain is used today in, I would say, in very uh, different industries, especially in the finance industry, in energy. But today, let's focus on something that uh, actually we can relate to, which is supply chain. So as I mentioned, blockchain is a shared computer. And every single transaction which are recorded in the computer are accessible to everybody. So uh, everybody can see uh, what has been entered in the blockchain and uh, who has been consulting it. So it has a very good application, implication when you want to do something about traceability. Uh, I mentioned here track and trace. Uh, you can attach uh, provenance of the fish, uh, every record about uh, the supply chain that you want to display. You can actually uh, incorporate it in the blockchain. And what it brings is actually it's reducing a lot of error. You know, in our industry today, uh, between the, the fishing boat company to the factories, to the importers and the retailer. It's basically an exchange of information by email, Excel files, PDF report, and so on. And there is a lot of error. Uh, I've been witnessing them for quite some time. And um, if you have a computer which is recording everything, everybody can have the same base to be able to uh, uh, check that everything is correct. So that's what we call about document management as well. And this is why blockchain is used today in many different fields and especially in the supply chain for, with logistic companies and also food companies. So yes, what's the difference? Uh, you're gonna tell me, okay, what uh, there is different application uh, today which are made for traceability, but as I mentioned, the nature of blockchain is that when an information is entered into it, you can't change it. And that's the thing. It will be there forever and everybody can consult it. So when you talk about transparency and trustability, this is a very powerful tool because it's a, it gives an incentive to everybody along the supply chain to make sure that the information that they are recording is correct. And this is what we believe the customers want today is to have actually a source of truth, a trustability application that they can trust. And this is by the nature of blockchain, uh, the big advantage that it brings to traceability. So uh, we mentioned that it's decentralized, distributed and immutable. This is the nature of blockchain. And uh, that's why we believe it is a kind of a step up on what has been done before. So it's not really a buzzword. Uh, you know, maybe some of you heard about blockchain, about Bitcoin in uh, 2016, 2017. But basically, today you have, I would say, the majority of Fortune 500 companies which are, which are actually experimenting or implementing a blockchain platform today. I just took very uh, uh, few brands about those retailers in France, uh, in US, and those brands. 
but basically every company has a team dedicated to implement blockchain technology today. It's not a buzzword anymore. We are in 2020. Uh, just in Thailand, to give you an example, I uh, would say that the major 10 companies here in Thailand are actually working with a blockchain team. So it's something that's going to happen. Uh, it's going to be more and more visible in supermarkets and uh, in the brand strategy for sustainability. And this is something not actually very difficult to get on board with. And this is what we, had, we have developed. And this is uh, the way that we want to attract people to use blockchain without uh, the difficulty around it. Just to give you an example very, to finish on that, how did those companies are using it? Uh, Walmart basically used them for recall. You know, when you have product recall, uh, um, through their blockchain application, they are able to reduce the time of recalling the goods uh, from two weeks to basically few seconds. And this is uh, actually quite valuable for a supermarket, as some of you may work with. Uh, you know that those recalls are costly and you want to have a reply to your customer very quickly. And this is uh, what uh, Walmart is, is using. Migro and Auchan and Carrefour are for traceability and provenance of the product not only the fish, but uh, dairy product and others. So what we have done and uh, what is our application that's kind of specialized in the tuna industry. Um, before going into it, uh, to give you the idea, I have to give the credits uh, to our friend at Three Sable and the Fiji, uh, Mr. Ken, I actually was the first one to start implementing blockchain technology for tracking tuna. Uh, it was actually tracking the whole fish and they made an experimentation with a company in the US where basically uh, you could have the QR code on the tail of the fish and you could scan it at your sushi shop and get actually the provenance of your fish. And um, we saw that it was really a great idea and a very great example, but what we wanted to do is to scale up to the commodity one, the canned tuna that people are using every day, the cheap can that you can find on some supermarket. And that was the difficulty uh, um, of development and uh, I think we succeeded to have this kind of application for uh, canned tuna. So we were the first one to use it for canned tuna. Uh, we launched it in end of 2018 and the first cans uh, arrived uh, mid of 2019 in Switzerland. Uh, we started with one customer, uh, MSC uh, certified customer, which is now Gustav Gehrig, and with two factories in Thailand, Sea Value and Thai Union, that some of you uh, actually know. And uh, we started with those three. The reason we choose, uh, we chose Switzerland is because everything in Switzerland is MSC certified. And I think it's very important when you want to bring trans transparency and traceability, you want, of course, to use uh, a sustainability label. And uh, as you may know, in Switzerland, everything is MSC. And so it was uh, actually a great fit to, to start this application. So we delivered it, people are using it since uh, end, I would say more than one year now, and uh, scanning the cans and we have uh, shipments every month uh, going out of Thailand to Switzerland and to actually other countries in Asia. So how does it work? Um, before going into it, uh, as I think uh, Dr. Paolo mentioned it a bit before, but uh, we actually were uh, interviewed for the FAO study on the sustainable blockchain and traceability. And we were the only application which was actually using a public blockchain uh, for traceability of fish. And um, so for a consumer point of view, it's very simple. Uh, you have a QR code on the can, people scan it with their phone, there is an, uh, a web application popping up, and then you have all the traceability of your fish, uh, where, is what, where was it caught, uh, where, uh, was it processed, when was it, um, by which factory, method of catching, everything that you want to display are popping up on the can. And uh, we choose with our customer exactly what they want to display. We can display whatever information that the customer wish, and um, we try to make it a bit, uh, I would say, uh, easy for the customers to read. And, uh, but it's very simple. You don't have to install any application on your phone. Is just popping up when you scan the QR code. So this is kind of how it works. I would try to not make it technical, but 
basically our application is this what we call the Atato Cloud. And either we connect directly to the factory's ERP or, um, or we develop an online web application where people can actually enter all the traceability data of the shipments directly on, in our application. What our application does is that it transfer those information and publish them on the blockchain. And so this is, we can attach any file that you wish, a PDF file, a pictures, a traceability report, I would say quality report, everything can be attached, published on the blockchain, and once it's there, everybody can access the data. That's a very important point, is that we did it on what we call the public blockchain, which is a difference compared to other traceability applications which are using private, is that in the public blockchain, basically everybody can check the information that is going to be entered in it. So if you are a journalist, an NGO, um, a government body, or anybody can access the information. So when you say that to a customer, uh, the first reaction is that they are kind of scared because uh, it's kind of a leap of faith to be able to provide those kind of information publicly to everybody. But uh, when they start using it, it's uh, kind of not of a um, major concern. And uh, all the actors, I have to say, all the factories uh, that have been using this application are actually very careful on entering the right data and to make sure that there will not be any mistakes for anybody to send. So um, this is what I mentioned also giving an incentive for people which are actually using this application to make sure that uh, all the data that they are recording is uh, actually accurate. So this is something I would just go after on the next slide, but uh, this is basically what we call the key data element. Uh, we are a member of uh, uh, GDST, the Global uh, Discussion on Seafood Traceability. And we are part of the tech team and uh, we actually work with them on the, developing the standard of those key data elements that need to be tracked and this is how uh, our application is recording it so uh, we have a lot of brand the species the catching method the net weight basically any key data element that you wish to publish are possible and uh, this is our web app this is for um, the, the factories which don't have uh, an ERP. Uh, we made a very simple uh, online uh, portal where all the records, all the, the contracts are entered and then the factory is entering the information inside. And uh, this is just an example, but uh, basically they record the number of cans, uh, every information about production, uh, provenance, um, uh, boat names and uh, fish traders, uh, information so it's it's working both way uh, either for smaller factory they use this uh, online application uh, where they do it manually and for the for the bigger one i would say we we connect directly we have an api uh, everything is done automatically uh, nobody has to do anything the data is entering directly in our application and then the client at the end is the one publishing on the blockchain we wanted to have this kind of additional layer of security if you want to make it this way, but to make sure that if you use this application, you will be the one reviewing everything, publish it on the blockchain, and after that, it's open for everybody to consult. So just to come back on, on why, why is it important and um, why actually you, you touched on about this, uh, Dr. Paolo, in your presentation, uh, Young generation in Europe and uh, in US everywhere are actually much and much more concerned about traceability and transparency. There was a, a big scandal in France uh, six years ago where basically there was some horse meat in some kind of ready uh, to eat uh, meals and people were starting to discover what was the supply chain for food product. They started to be very scared about, so they want to know what inside what what are they buying what's inside the can uh, that they are buying today and uh, this is a demand that is growing uh, every year it's a demand for sustainability and transparency and that's why all those retailers and brands are actually using those kind of blockchain uh, application to be able to say we are totally transparent with you we are going to give you full access to our supply chain 
every information that you are going to see are the same one that we receive. And this is, one, uh, this is how we can build confidence with uh, our customers. And I think this is going, which is really going to change. You know, every year you have some, um, you have Greenpeace making a, a review on sustainability uh, for brands in North America. So this is something which is going to be very important for brands in the future to be able to show that they are completely transparent and that they share all the information with their customers. So as I mentioned before, trustability standards are very important. Uh, I think blockchain is not going to, uh, um, to change them in any ways. It's just a complement. And I think it's an additional layer of transparency and trust uh, um, to give actually uh, confidence for the customers. And that's why we are a member of the GDST. That's why we, our application is actually uh, able to uh, support any kind of standard uh, that you wish to implement. And uh, hopefully, the GDST standards are going to be uh, uh, widely accepted uh, by most of the brand in the tuna industry. And uh, I think it's going to be much easier in the future to actually compare data and uh, compare trustability information. Last but not least, in some ways, um, our application, you know, when you scan the QR codes, this was a demand from uh, some of our customers. They wanted to know, uh, well, basically, who was scanning, where, uh, at uh, what frequency. And uh, our application is able to give data analytics reports on the people uh, in which area are they scanning. You can actually use it to promote a sustainability to your customer. If someone is scanning the can, you can give them some kind of reward points that they can reuse for another uh, purchase. And it gives you some analytics about if people care actually about trustability and sustainability, are they using the app or not? So this is an additional uh, information that uh, our, our application is providing. So yes, that's almost it for me. Uh, I try to go uh, kind of fast, and, uh, but some parts are quite technical. I would be happy to uh, reply to any questions that you have and I uh, would like to thank you so much for your time and uh, for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Maxim. Uh, thank you so much for that interesting presentation. Uh, we would like to thank all the speakers for sharing their valuable information to us uh, during this uh, webinar, at this webinar. Now we will proceed uh, with the question uh, Q&A a session uh, just before we address the questions from the participants uh, we have prepared some of the questions for all the speakers uh, the first question is uh, this question is directed to all the speakers uh, in summary how can we promote sustainability with regards to your respective topics i'll start off with dr paula bray and then move on to catherine and maxine dr paula bray Well, uh, I think uh, InfoFish uh, has already done uh, a lot uh, over the years to highlight uh, sustainability, to promote sustainability to, the, to its member countries and member companies and uh, companies that attend all their uh, communication events. And um, in fact, uh, Chuna, in particular, has been uh, a precursor in this in this uh, arena of sustainability uh, over the years, and uh, even now is showing that it is really able to approach the issue. Uh, I think that um, there is a need uh, for more clarification. Uh, in the, Sustainability claim uh, is now appearing uh, everywhere and uh, in every website, every booth at the trade show, everybody is sustainable. And of course, there are different level of uh, claims. There are uh, self claims from the companies. There are uh, like um, claims from um, seafood guides, which don't uh, run audits on site, don't run surveillance. They're just based on generic uh, desktop uh, information. And, uh, and there are uh, second party certifications which are not supervised by government at government level, at the country level. 
and then there are uh, certifications which are uh, accredited uh, by national accreditation bodies are supervised by national accreditation bodies like uh, global gap brc ifs uh, not not all of these are uh, related to sustainability and like friend of the sea so uh, i think uh, the the time is right now to have a more mature approach to the issue just like organic is regulated and uh, nobody would ever dream because they would be fined to claim that they are organic if they are not same should be for sustainability so i think uh, the challenge for the future and i would we would like infofish and its member countries uh, and the companies involved uh, to really help us to push for this um, is to uh, provide the clarity by means of uh, some form of uh, regulation so that uh, companies will not be able to make uh, self claims and they have to rely on a third party certification because this is the way the world goes for any type of uh, claim you put on a product so we would really like to see um, help on this to promote this uh, concept uh, because it will be useful for everybody for consumers for companies who are really doing the right thing and so on thanks thank you um dr paul um miss catherine would you like to add yeah so i think as as paolo mentioned uh, what infofish is doing in terms of uh promoting and getting the word out there of, of what is available in the world. Um, that really helps consumers know what they can demand once they understand what is actually possible um, to ask for. Um, so I think during, during the presentation, and well, both the blockchain technology as well, we've seen that already there are many tools that are available to protect the oceans and to use them sustainably to gain information about them in a, in a way that really interests just about everybody using them. Um, however, I think that to keep moving forward and to really make those kind of tools succeed, we need everybody to know about them, but we also need everybody to, to be aligned. Um, so obviously what the industry needs isn't always what regulators want, and we really need everybody to work together to, um, to really make those tools uh, yeah, become a reality. So really, I think governments and regulators, they have the final say in what they want from the industry, what they want from us, and, and they're the ones that need to propose um, specific guidelines for the implementation of, of tools like, like EM, um, which, is, which should hopefully take off in the next few years. Um, so they should use the, the pandemic to really, um, to really push this forward and, and make this technology keep growing and, and get the most out of it. Perfect. Um, Maxim. Yes, uh, actually, uh, uh, I kind of agree uh, with both of my uh, colleague presenters. Um, I think it's really coming from the customers at the end. And uh, we see uh, during those past few years that they have been asking uh, for more uh, pro for more traceability application and more transparency. Um, that's why we wanted to uh, to do something in that field. And I think it's it's changing the industry in some ways that people should not be afraid of transparency. And um, that was something that was kind of uh, uh, new in the tuna industry. And people were kind of secrets about uh, their suppliers, the way they were uh, trading, and uh, about the supply chain in general, because they were kind of afraid that if something happened, well, they're going to be blamed for that. Uh, today, uh, everything's changed. Uh, you have companies like Tayunion, which have actually a great program for sustainability. They are promoting it. And um, when you use those kind of applications, you want to show transparency. I think uh, adoptions of sustainability will come through transparency. And um, yeah, that's, that's what I believe. Thank you, Maxim. Thank you so much for your response. Um, now, um, sustainability is the future of tuna and the wider seafood industry. So is your vision for all tuna products one day be economically, socially, and environmentally stable? And how far are we from that vision? Um, I'll start with Maxim. Well, I hope we are not that far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope we are not that far, but um, just from my experience, yeah. uh, in the past of 10 years, uh, for me, it's, it's day and night already. Uh, people, 
maybe don't realize it, but uh, actually people are much more conscious about sustainability, traceability, the way they buy their food, how they consume. And it's a general trend. It's not only in, uh, in fencing country in Europe, it's everywhere. And um, when you are a brand, uh, you want to satisfy your customer and you have to go into that direction. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Paolo uh, made a presentation as well on plant-based uh, um, uh, meat and uh, seafood. And this is the direction where it's going. It's growing very fast and it's going to grow. There is no reason to stop. So uh, that's, I believe that's what's going to push uh, for more trustability and transparency. And I hope it's going to be, uh, I would say, hopefully uh, uh, in the next uh, five to 10 years. Dr. Paolo Gray, would you like to add anything? Yes. Um... <clears throat> As I mentioned, uh, we feel that the, the tuna industry in particular has, uh, has taken a lot of important steps to improve. Uh, I always uh, tell the story that in the first uh, years of, of my activity, when I was very young, I met the companies and they were telling them to go dolphin safe, to change their suppliers, and they were looking at me as if I was a Martian coming from Mars because uh, nobody would ever think of telling them something like this. And nowadays, as I explained, uh, instead everybody is claiming to be sustainable. And uh, But behind all this, uh, there is really a change, a change in the approach by the companies, by the RFMOs, by the countries themselves. And we have seen all this. Uh, but if the question is uh, how far we are, I think um, for some aspects we are still very far and we, we really need to make an extra effort to, to, to change, in particular social accountability. There, there are still uh, ongoing widely spread situations of uh, mistreatment of uh, crews and seafarers uh, at sea. In particular, one of the issues, uh, even though one should not generalize, is long liners in certain areas of the world where uh, crew are kept, uh, and we have seen this through the audits, uh, and the, of course the companies did not pass, uh, more than one year at sea without returning at land. And this is widespread on most of the long liners in certain areas. So this has to be approached uh, also through the RFMOs, and it can be solved in relatively short time and will also lead to a more fair competition between certain fleets and uh, certain air others which instead uh, comply with the uh, human rights and uh, all the workers regulations ILO resolutions etc the second uh, problem which is a bit more difficult to approach is the ecosystem impact when uh, we look uh, in a very satisfied way to uh, a good part of the tuna stocks uh, uh, getting very close to or even uh, reaching a, a maximum sustainable yield, we should uh, still remember that uh, the biomass that is actually taken out of the sea in terms of uh, tuna total biomass, in most cases it's, it has been and it is currently 50% of the original and in some cases it's even more up to 60 or 70 percent so there is obviously an impact on the global ecosystem because uh, of the fact that tuna are main uh, predators etc and uh, and this should be taken into account because we have to decide uh, also what is sustainable in terms of biomass taken out not just uh, as economically sustainable which is what msy is telling us Catherine, do you want to add? Yep. So, um, yeah, I, I, I definitely think that sustainability is the is the future. I really think a lot of things are possible that we really didn't uh, realize were possible a few years ago, or think that could be possible a few years ago. So, I mean, with with technology, I think growth is exponential. Um, right now, we're in a really exciting time where we're reaching the end of the testing or the pilot phase of, of lots of different projects. And I think we're really starting to get an idea of how much reach, um, you know, technology can have in terms of uh, ensuring sustainability. And we're building an image of what the future is going to look like. 
Um, so I, I kind of have to turn again to, to electronic monitoring, but it is really one of the most powerful tools that the fishing industry in general has to monitor just about everything. So from sustainable and um, sorry, social injustice that Paolo was mentioning, um, I think it could be combined perfectly well with uh, blockchain technologies like Maxime talked about. Um, and it's a way to really just control any unsustainable practices, whether it's from a social perspective or from an environmental um, perspective. So how long uh, that's going to take to be really fully implemented or how far we're from that, it's, uh, it's difficult to say. I'm not going to give you a, a figure. But um, yeah, I, I hope that we're, we're working towards a future where EM is going to be fully adopted by the industry and that it will become the norm for, for consumers to just buy tuna that they know comes from fully traceable and fully transparent sources. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, thank you so much for all your responses. And we will now take some of, take uh, a lot of questions from the participants. Um, we'll start off with Dr. Paula Bray. Is a question from the participant. Um, how is Friend of the Sea looking into fish welfare and driving the certification? Well, uh, the, um, as far as fish welfare, we um, started uh, two years ago a project uh, with uh, a, a Swiss based but international NGO called Fair Fish, uh, founded by Open Philanthropy. Uh, whereby we have uh, carried out gap analysis at all uh, Friend of the Sea certified aquaculture plants around the world in terms of uh, fish welfare. And uh, based on uh, these results, uh, fair fish uh, technicians and biologists have developed uh, um, um, requirements, uh, approximately 150 requirements for 25 different species because fish welfare is different from species to species, obviously, like uh, Turbo likes to stay all close together in a, in a mm. tank and uh, other fish uh, prefer, you know, lower densities. So um, uh, based on this, we have developed uh, the new aquaculture uh, standards, which includes also changes to other requirements not related to fish welfare. And these are about to be um, uh, passed over to the technical committee for the normal review. So uh, we already had some uh, fish welfare standards, but uh, definitely not so uh, extended as this one. So this is what we're doing. And we are also uh, trying to create, uh, you know, generate awareness. We organize webinars about this and uh, provided information, uh, you know, globally to the media, etc. because it, it's a very important issue. You had, uh, you had uh, mentioned uh, plant and self-based companies will grow and reduce pressure on wild stocks. But in terms of sustainability, isn't it better to work with tuna and seafood companies to make them more sustainable than to look at uh, alternative seafood type? Uh, and yeah, it's a question from yeah. one of the participants. Yeah, the, 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 the answer is uh, we are, uh, um, let's say moving together with both. Uh, obviously, for a long time, there will still be, uh, maybe forever, people uh, eating seafood, and uh, they want a, a good part of them want to know and should be aware of uh, how it is produced and if it's the company is respecting the environment and workers. And this is our job uh, for all these many years. At the same time, we should not be not sensible to uh, newcomers in the field. And uh, obviously, uh, because this is our mission, we feel that uh, the plant-based alternative uh, for those who want to go in that direction is a very good, uh, potentially a very good alternative. It takes pressure off the stocks, but uh, one has to verify how the agricultural products are produced. And uh, we have been uh, already working on uh, sustainable agriculture certification for the past uh, three, four years with the Friend of the Earth. So we, let's say, are the perfect uh, uh, organization to be able to uh, approach in terms of audit and certification 
also this new type of alternative uh, products because we can check that and uh, put everybody at a fair level where um, so where everybody can play according let's say to the same rules uh, and sustainability requirements and, and certification so this is our approach all right excellent um you had mentioned about the the, the audit uh, program uh, so that, uh, there's a question from the participant on how would it, this program address ensuring compliance in areas where there is limited internet connectivity access, which is currently a challenge with remote auditing? Yes, uh, uh, the, the system uh, adapts to areas of lower connectivity, basically in a few words, uh, untechnical words, by reducing the frames of the videos. So it can be applied also in these areas. And of course, where the problem is huge, there's no connectivity, uh, an audit on site has to be carried out. Uh, and uh, however, uh, surveillances, which are maybe based on some critical issues in areas where the connection is better, uh, like the production area, processing area, and so on, can be carried, then carried out remotely. Um, so there is a way to, to definitely to solve this, but the benefit, and I think you, you see that there's another question about the benefit and the difference between on-site yeah. audit, so I will just jump on that. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, definitely there is a benefit in carrying out the audit this way, apart from those that I already mentioned, which are obvious, reduction in time, in money, and uh, in pollution, in stress for the auditor, etc. The, the difference uh, and advances uh, are evident when one looks at the audit report. Uh, the normally, uh, a normal audit report uh, is uh, um, a document written by the auditor with very few images and uh, normally no videos. In the case of the SARA audit, uh, there is a full video recording of the audit. Uh, from the beginning to the end, and uh, this is immediately put on blockchain. So basically, anybody will in the future be able to see how the actual audit was carried out, and uh, if the auditor actually saw all the relevant areas in the company, if he actually saw the uh, unloading of the vessels. So it's the same added value that uh, onboard uh, CCTVs can provide with the new technologies as we have seen and uh, and so there's no doubt that this is a, an advanced uh, is, is an enhancement in terms of the evidence that uh, can be provided of course this can be used also in combination uh, with the given frequency with the on-site audit uh, which uh, also allow maybe to see something additionally uh, but definitely it is not something just for the COVID era. It's something that has to be go on and has to be accepted by the national accreditation bodies, accepted by the companies, because it's really uh, an important uh, step ahead. All right. Um, you clearly answered the questions. Uh, so for all the, for all the questions, um, I have another question here. Um, what kind of premium price in percentage would friend of the sea certified can or non can tuna products may get in the international trade? Well, uh, uh, there have been some studies uh, which uh, claim that in cert for certain retailers, uh, this is up to 5% uh, or 10% more. However, I always tell companies that the real added value of a certification is, is not that. The certification uh, is becoming a must, so sooner or later the prices will level down. Uh, consumers expect you to be sustainable and they would be very surprised if you're not uh, 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 protecting the environment and uh, treating workers in the right way. So in the long term and even right now in certain countries, this is becoming a must. So one should not really expect, if not in the early stages, uh, an added uh, price. 
The other added value is that uh, you can, with the independent auditor, verify your suppliers on uh, something which is normally not verified, because normally you would verify quality, etc., uh, which is the environmental impact and, um, and the social accountability. So this provides the company which much uh, more security, safety in terms of what it's doing and what its suppliers are doing and uh, reduces the risk of uh, problems in terms of image uh, facing pressure groups, etc. So this is the most important uh, reason why you should go for that. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Paolo Berry, for that, um, uh, res for your responses. Uh, Catherine, do you have a MOU or joint operation with Indonesia provider? Um, at Can the from, moment, uh, I don't. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, yes. I don't believe so at the moment. So feel free to to contact me okay. in that regard. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, probably one on the uh, this asking for your email address. Uh, okay. Probably you can put that on the chat chat uh, box as well. Yes. Um, there's another question here uh, for you. Um, are the, the boys deployed on pads capable of providing the temperature for the water in real time? Yeah. Um, so we have we have several sensors on the on the buoys, and one of them is a temperature sensor. So yes, um, right now it's it's not quite as accurate as measuring it from satellite because of course the, the buoy structure itself heats up with the sun, but, um, but yes, we do have temperature sensors and you know, in, the, in the future they'll get more and more accurate. So that could also be a way of um, validating satellite data and satellite temperature maps of the oceans. How many have already been used by tuna vessels? Um, well, eco sounder buoys in general are are pretty widespread uh, at the moment. Um, buoys like the the ISD, the one I mentioned that has the double eco sounder that can tell the difference between the species. Um, implementation has been fairly slow. Obviously, it's a product that's been you know in development, and we require we it, it takes some time to get information from the from the fishermen on what has been caught, then and, and then really makes a buoy. Um, make sure that the buoy is working. So we know that like now we're very happy with, with how they are working. And right now I think there are a couple hundred in the Indian Ocean. There are also a few in, in other oceans. Of course, we hope that in the future, every eco sounder buoy will have this capability because like I said, we, we really think that it's the way to move forward for sustainability. It helps um, per sign mm -hmm. fishermen increase the selectivity of their gear. So yeah, hopefully in the future it will be a lot more, a lot more common. Um, there's a question here, um, why was Chile chosen for the Ghost Gear Initiative? Uh, Chile was where Burio was working. So Burio is the, oh. the part of, the, of this project that really had the infrastructure. They, were, they already had started some net recycling projects in, in other places in Chile, but kind of needed, needed support to really um, get that project to take off. So that's where, where we came in. And um, basically, because they were already there, they already had the contacts and had the infrastructure to to get the project off the ground. So that's where we that's why we started there. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine, for those responses. Uh, Maxine, yes. what are some of the major seafood companies, uh, especially tuna, in Thailand using blockchain technology? So um, in Thailand, we work with uh, mostly three factories, but uh, Tainan and Sea Value okay. and another one. And um, yeah. I would say in terms of... Um, um, yeah, so uh, we work with those factories. And um, last year, Bumblebee uh, started a blockchain traceability program uh, for their frozen fish, for their frozen tuna fish. And in Cannes, I think Walmart China is doing something, and now they're, it's mostly coming from the retailer side. So it's a retailer's brand. And I have to say it's kind of new. It started really last year. So uh, yes, we are uh, hopefully to have major brands coming up. All right. How much is the cost to participate with your company, and how is the procedure? 
So we try to make it very simple and very easy. And um, basically the software is there. So you just have to contact us and we make it under your brand, uh, what we call for the viewer. And uh, for the cost itself to give you a range, it's going to be less than one cent per cam, US dollar. So we try to make it as there is no impact on the retail price of the cam tube. Um, when will the quantum quantum computers break the blockchain? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I replied to this question. Um, thank you very much uh, for that. I think when we are quite far yet for quantum computers to be able to uh, be mainstream, uh, we have quite some years ahead of us. So I think for, to that part, uh, computer science will, uh, will be able to solve the problem. Okay. Thank you so much for all your responses to the, the questions. I have a last question for everyone. Uh, I'll, I'll open up these uh, questions to all the... Uh, so many of the solutions demonstrated in today's webinar seem to do a great job of providing traceability solutions for industrial twin trees who already have the lion's shares of the marketplace. Small scale fisheries also have a huge potential to contribute to the sustainable seafood market or support any more livelihoods than industrial fishing techniques. How do the speakers today hope to address the traceability needs of small scale fishers to enable them to compete in the global marketplace? I'll start with Dr. Paolo Bray. Well, the, the SARA audit uh, allows uh, to reduce the audit costs uh, more than 50% because all the travel costs are cut and, uh, and also time is uh, shorter for the audit. So this uh, will uh, allow and is already allowing Friend of the Sea to be accessible to by small scale uh, fisheries or aquaculture. Um, so this is an improvement in this sense. This is as far as our technology is concerned. So I, I just uh, leave it to the others for their, which are more specific to the technologies. Catherine, would you, would you say something? Yeah, um, so I definitely agree. Uh, I, a lot of these technologies obviously have a, have a really high cost and so they're, um, they're easier to implement for industrial fishermen or fisheries. But we, we also try to work directly with artisanal fisheries, so small scale fisheries. Um, as I mentioned, we've adapted, for instance, our vessel monitoring system um, into what we call the VMS Nano. So that's a very cost effective, um, much smaller, much easier to implement solution that is geared specifically towards artis artisanal fisheries, which are generally completely unmonitored and of course have have less ability to install big expensive systems that only rely on satellite communications. So, so for instance, the, the VMS Nano uses um, GSM networks together with satellite to really reduce costs for, um, for that type of vessel. And um, same for, for the electronic monitoring systems. So we also have several solutions depending on vessel size. We completely recognize that the requirements of you know an industrial purse signer are not the same as the requirements of a small pole and line fisherman or 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 smaller long liners even so um so we've adapted our our technology to those requirements and um yeah it's it's just a matter of really getting them implemented thank you catherine maxim um, yeah, it's a very good point because uh, if we want something, if we want a traceability application to succeed, it needs to be affordable for everybody. Uh, that's how actually we, we priced uh, our application coming from this world. I know that uh, uh, if you change the price by one or two percent, uh, people we are not going to pay for it. So um, that's why we try to have cost to be reduced at the minimum uh, for, for it to not have any impact on the shelves. And I think in terms of traceability and sustainability, it's coming from the customers now. It's going to be shared among uh, the factories, the importers and the distributors uh, from now, much better than, than previously. Thank you. Thank you, Maxim. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you, Dr. Paolo Bray thank you. for that uh, informative response.
uh, we have come to the end of our webinar today. Um, again, we would like to uh, ask the participants if they could take time to answer the poll questions, uh, which is available under the poll tab. Uh, before we conclude for today's webinar, we would like to uh, invite you once, once again to our InfoFish 2 not 2021 uh, virtual prelude on the 14th of October. Um, we'll have the, the web banner up on the screen shortly. We have a tuna. The we have the tuna prelude um, event coming up on the 14th of October. I'm pleased to announce that the UN Special and for the Ocean Ambassador Peter Thompson will deliver a special address. Uh, we encourage everyone to register for this event. So please uh, register. Uh, to this uh, event, and you will provide this link on the chat box that is provided. Um, we, again, we would like to thank all the speakers for sharing their expertise, their available time, and continuous support to InfoFish. Also, a special thank you to our event sponsors, Settling, Digital Observer Services, and WSO, um, World Sustainability Organization. Thank you so much for your generous, uh, generous contribution and making this webinar a success. And to all the participants, thank you so much for joining us at today's webinar, and we hope to see you at the next InfoFish webinar. So for of us here at the um, InfoFish Malaysia, thank you, goodbye, and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank Catherine. You very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paolo Murray.